Hi everyone, it's Professor Primpton. In this video, we're going to talk about points of inflection and the second derivative test. So in the previous video, we talked about how to use the second derivative to find out intervals where the function is either concave up or concave down. Now we're going to use the second derivative to find out what's called points of inflection of the function, and also to use the first and second derivatives of the function to provide a sketch of the graph with local extrema and points of inflection. So let's pick up where we left off. We're going to talk about points of inflection or inflection points. In the previous couple examples, we looked at the concavity, and we saw that the concavity does not necessarily change when the second derivative is either zero or undefined. In the function f of x equals x cubed, subtract 6x squared plus 9x plus 1, the concavity did change at the point 2 comma 3. This point is what's called an inflection point. So the definition of an inflection point. An inflection point is a point on the graph of a function where the concavity of the function changes from concave up to concave down, or from concave down to concave up. In other words, a point of inflection or inflection point is a point on the graph where its second derivative changes sign. So before we use the second derivative and a sign chart to find out if the concavity changes from up to down or down to up, let's look at a graph. Example four, points of inflection. Determine at which of the labeled points in the graph shown below are inflection points. So notice the graph bends up and down at several different points in the graph. So you have these points, a, b, c, d, e, f, g, and h. Notice that the function is first concave up because the graph is bending up. Then the graph is bending down. Then it looks like it's bending down. And then the graph is bending up again. So the graph is concave up on several different intervals, and it's also concave down on several different intervals. Notice in the graph that whenever the concavity changes, those points are called inflection points. So notice in the graph that you are first concave up, and then you're concave down. So then at this point B, that's called an inflection point because it's changing from bending up before this point B and then it's bending down after the point B. So B is called an inflection point. Same thing with point G. Point G is also an inflection point because the graph is concave down and then it changes to concave up. So you're bending down before point G and then it's changing to curving up after G. The point A is a local minimum Point E is a local minimum, and point H is a local minimum, and then you have local maxima at C and F. So it's relatively easy to find inflection points if you're given the graph. Well, the strategy will be find the second derivative of the function, construct a sign chart for the second derivative so we can find out whether the graph is either concave up or concave down. And how do you find the values that go on the sign chart? Well, it's where the second derivative is either zero or undefined. Example five, finding points of inflection. Let f of x be the function x cubed, g of x is the function x to the fourth power, and h of x is x to the one third power be differentiable functions, so you can find the derivative of each of these functions. Determine which of these functions has an inflection point at the origin 0, 0. So you have the graph of f of x, g of x, and h of x given, but let's not use the graph this time. Let's find out if the function has an inflection point at 0, 0 for each one. So let's take a look at the function f of x first. f of x is x cubed. We know that we need the second derivative, so let's find the first derivative. f prime of x is 3x squared, and then the second derivative will be 6x, using the power rule a couple times. Now, find out where the second derivative is either undefined or zero. Notice that it's a polynomial, it's just 6 times x, so f double prime of x is undefined, never occurs. However, f double prime of x could be zero, so 6 times x equals zero gives you an equation that you can solve, and so dividing both sides of the equation by 6, you'll get x equals zero. So x equals zero needs to go on the sign chart for the second derivative. So now the next step is to make a sign chart for the second derivative. So sign chart for f double prime of x, plot x equals zero on your sign chart. Now x equals zero is not a point of inflection unless the concavity changes. Just because we came up with x equals zero doesn't automatically mean it's an inflection point. It's only where the signs change for the second derivative. So x equals zero divides this number line up into two different parts, x values less than zero and x values greater than zero. So let's choose an x value that's less than zero. How about x equals negative one? And an x value that's greater than zero, how about x equals positive one? These values go into the second derivative to find out the sign of the second derivative. So f double prime of negative one would be six times negative one, which gives you negative six. So you get a negative number at x equals negative one. So on this part of the interval, the second derivative has a negative sign, which means the original function is concave down. Now let's try f double prime of positive one f double prime of at 1 is 6 times positive 1, which gives you positive 6. So in this part of the interval, where x values are greater than 0, the second derivative is a positive number. So that means your original function, f of x, is concave up. 
So notice that the second derivative does change sign at x equals 0. So that means the function f of x has an inflection point at 0, 0. Now let's look at g of x. g of x was the function x to the fourth. So again, we need two derivatives. So let's find the derivative using the power rule a couple times. So if g of x is x to the fourth, g prime of x would be 4x cubed. And now take another derivative. g double prime would be 12x squared. So again, notice that the second derivative can either be 0 or undefined. Since it's a polynomial, g double prime of x is undefined, never occurs. So you don't get any values for the number line when g double prime is undefined. However, g double prime of x could be 0. So if g double prime of x is equal to 0, that means 12x squared equals 0. So divide both sides of the equation by 12, and you'll get x squared equals 0. And now take the square root on both sides of the equation, and you get x equals 0 again. And so x equals 0 goes on to a number line for the second derivative. So you make this number line 0 again divides up the number line into two different parts. You have x values less than 0, and you have x values greater than 0. So sign chart for the second derivative of g of x. Let's plug in negative 1 into the second derivative. g double prime of negative 1 would be 12 times negative 1 squared. That's 12 times positive 1, or just positive 12. So for x values less than 0, the second derivative is a positive number. That means the original function g of x is concave up. Now let's try x equals positive 1. Plug 1 into the second derivative. So g double prime of 1 would give you 12 times 1 squared, which is 12 times 1 again, or positive 12. So for x values greater than 0, the second derivative is also positive, which means the function g of x is concave up again. So you don't have a change in the concavity. You were concave up, and you stayed concave up on either side of x equals 0. So x equals 0 is not where an inflection point would occur. So there are no inflection points for the function g of x. Now let's try the last function. The last function was h of x equals x to the 1 3rd power. So a fraction power this time. So again, we need two derivatives. So find the derivative using the power rule. h prime of x would be take 1 3rd and make it a coefficient. Subtract 1 from the power. So 1 3rd times x to the negative 2 thirds power. Now take another derivative using the power rule and constant multiple rule. So h double prime of x would be you keep the coefficient 1 3rd. But now you use the power rule again. So negative 2 thirds comes down to make it a coefficient again, negative 2 thirds. And now subtract 1 from the exponent again. So x to the negative 2 thirds, subtract 1 will give you x to the negative 5 thirds power. And so now we have to simplify because we want to find out where is the second derivative of 0 or undefined. So let's make this a fraction. You have 1 third times negative 2 thirds. So that's negative 2 in the numerator and 3 times 3, 9 in the denominator. And you have x to the negative 5 thirds. So keep in mind, if you have a negative exponent on the variable, that's actually in the opposite side of the fraction. So you have x to negative 5 thirds, that's really in the denominator. So negative 2 is in the numerator, 9 in the denominator, and x to the positive 5 thirds in the denominator. So make sure that you simplify the function first to make it a fraction so you can find out where is the second root of 0 or undefined more easily. So h double prime of x equals 0 means negative 2 divided by 9 times x to the 5 thirds equals 0. Now, keep in mind, a fraction is equal to 0 if the numerator is equal to 0. So that means negative 2 equals 0. Well, that doesn't make any sense. So this is no solution to the equation, h double prime of x equals 0. And so there are no values that go on the number line so far. But you have to keep in mind, h double prime of x could be undefined because we do have a fraction this time. So h double prime of x is undefined if the denominator is equal to 0 because we can't divide by 0. So the denominator of the second derivative was 9x to the 5 thirds power. Set it equal to 0. 9 times x to the 5 thirds equals 0. Divide both sides of the equation by 9 first. So you get x to the 5 thirds equals 0 divided by 9 is still 0. And now, since x to the 5 thirds is equal to 0, that means x must be equal to 0. So you do have one value to go on the number line, x equals 0. So let's make a sign chart for the second derivative of h of x. So sign chart for h double prime of x, x equals 0 goes on the sign chart. Again, it divides the number line up into x values less than 0 and x values greater than 0. Choose some test values. I'm going to, again, choose x equals negative 1 and x equals positive 1. These values go into the second derivative, h double prime of x. So if you plug in negative 1 into the second derivative, you'll find out that the sign will be a positive number. That means that the function h of x is concave up. And if you plug 1 into the second derivative of h of x, you'll find out that the sign is negative, which means that the original function h of x is concave down. So there is a change in concavity here. It changes from concave up to concave down. So you do have an inflection point at 0, 0 for the function h of x. Let's try another example, example 6. 
Finding points of inflection. Find the points of inflection or inflection points of the function f of x equals natural log of x squared subtract 2x plus 5. So the function f of x is a natural logarithm function. We know that we need to find the second derivative of this function so that we can find out is the function concave up or concave down. So let's find out the first derivative. f prime of x would be, now notice it's a composite function, so you have to use the chain rule. The derivative would be 1 divided by the argument, so 1 divided by x squared minus 2x plus 5, that's the inside function, times the derivative of the inside function, so d dx of x squared minus 2x plus 5. And now, what's the derivative of the inside function? Derivative of x squared is 2x, and derivative of negative 2x is negative 2, and derivative of 5 is 0. So you have this fraction times 2x minus 2. So that's the numerator, 2x minus 2, and the denominator is still x squared minus 2x plus 5. You would stop here if you're finding out if the function is increasing or decreasing or any local max or local min. But we're not doing that. We're looking for inflection points. So we need another derivative. So f double prime of x. Notice that you need to take the derivative of the first derivative. The first derivative is now a rational function. It's a quotient of two different polynomials. So you have to use the quotient rule to find the second derivative. So f double prime of x would be low x squared minus 2x plus 5 in parentheses times the derivative of top, or high, so d dx of 2x minus 2, minus high, so 2x minus 2 stays exactly as it is, times the derivative of low, so d dx of x squared minus 2x plus 5. Now don't forget, with the quotient rule, it's all divided by the denominator, all squared. So x squared minus 2x plus 5, in parentheses, all to the second power. So we have a couple derivatives to find. We have derivative of high and derivative of low to find. So low, x squared minus 2x plus 5, stays exactly as it is times the derivative of high would be derivative of 2x minus 2, that's 2, minus high stays exactly as it is this time, so 2x minus 2, and now the derivative of low, derivative of x squared minus 2x plus 5, we did this one a little bit earlier, the derivative would be 2x minus 2. And then don't forget about the denominator, it's all divided by x squared minus 2x plus 5 in parentheses, all to the second power. So now let's simplify this second derivative so we can find out where is it equal to 0 or undefined. And so if you simplify, 2 times x squared is 2x squared, 2 times negative 2x is negative 4x. 2 times 5 will give you 10. So now you have a minus sign in front of before you do FOIL. So when you do FOIL, the minus sign will just change all the signs. So 2x times 2x is 4x squared, but the minus sign will make it negative 4x squared. You have 2x times negative 2, that's negative 4x, but the minus sign in front will make it positive 4x. Same thing, negative 2 times 2x will give you negative 4x. The negative sign will make it positive 4x. And then negative 2 times negative 2 is 4 but then the minus sign makes it negative 4. So that's the numerator, all divided by x squared minus 2x plus 5, all squared, and the denominator. So let's see if we have any like terms that we can combine. You have 2x squared minus 4x squared, that's negative 2x squared. You have negative 4x plus 4x plus 4x, so you have 4x total. And then the constant term, you have 10 subtract 4, that's 6. So that's the numerator, negative 2x squared plus 4x plus 6, and the denominator is unchanged x squared minus 2x plus 5, all in parentheses to the second power. So you might be thinking, is this derivative simplified as far as possible? No. The numerator has a negative 2 in common with all three terms. So take the second derivative, f double prime of x, factor out the negative 2 from the numerator. Negative 2, and you'll have an x squared from the first term. You'll have a negative 2x from the second term. And then you'll have a negative 3 from the third term after you factor out a negative 2. We're not going to change the denominator at all, so keep it the same. So then, after you factor out the negative 2, you have three terms. Maybe it can be factored even further. So what are two numbers that multiply to negative 3, and the same two numbers need to add to negative 2? The numbers that work are negative 3 and positive 1. So yes, this factors even further. So the numerator will be negative 2, x minus 3, and x plus 1, and the denominator stays exactly as it is. So why are we simplifying and doing all this work? Because the more that we simplify, the easier it is to find the values where the second derivative is 0 or undefined. So the second derivative, f double prime of x, is equal to 0 if the numerator is 0 of this fraction. So that means negative 2 times x minus 3 times x plus 1 is equal to 0. So that means negative 2 can't be 0, but x equals 3 is one of the values, and x equals negative 1 is also a solution. So these values will go on the sign chart. But you can't forget about the second derivative might be undefined. So f double prime of x is undefined. That means where the denominator is equal to 0. So the quantity x squared minus 2x plus 5, all squared, equals 0. So take the square root on both sides of the equation to get rid of this square power. So then that means x squared minus 2x plus 5 equals 0. 
Now, if you try factoring, there won't be any whole numbers that will multiply to 5, and the same two numbers will add to negative 2. So you have to solve this using the quadratic formula. The quadratic formula will give you no real solutions. You'll have a square root of a negative number when you use the quadratic formula. So there are no x values from this equation to place on the number line. So the only values that will go on the sign chart are x equals 3 and x equals negative 1. So make sure they're in numerical order. Negative 1 comes first on the number line and then 3. So this breaks the number line up into three different parts. x values less than negative 1, x values between negative 1 and 3, and x values greater than 3. So let's choose test values and plug them into the second derivative to find out the sign. So let's choose x equals negative 2 because that's on the left side of negative 1. x equals 0 is between negative 1 and 3. And x equals 4 is an x value greater than 3. So let's plug in negative 2 into the second derivative. So f double prime of negative 2 will be negative 2 times negative 2 minus 3 times negative 2 plus 1 in the numerator. Negative 2 squared in the denominator minus 2 times negative 2 plus 5. And that's all to the second power in the denominator. If you simplify the numerator, you'll get negative 10. The denominator will give you 13 squared or 169. And so notice that this fraction is a negative number. So for x values less than negative 1, the second derivative is a negative number. That means the function f of x is concave down. Now let's plug in x equals 0. x equals 0 into the second derivative will give you negative 2 times 0 minus 3 times 0 plus 1 in the numerator, and then 0 squared minus 2 times 0 plus 5, all to the second power in the denominator. So the numerator will simplify to give you 6. The denominator will be 5 squared or 25, and so you get a positive number, a positive fraction. So x values between negative 1 and 3, the function f of x is concave up. And so now x equals 4, plug that into the second derivative, you'll get f double prime of 4 is negative 2 times 4 minus 3 times 4 plus 1, all divided by 4 squared minus 2 times 4 plus 5, all to the second power in the denominator. If you simplify this time, you'll get negative 10 divided by 13 squared, or negative 10 divided by 169, so a negative number. And so the second derivative is a negative number, which means the original function f of x is concave down again. So you have a couple places where the function changes concavity. It went from concave down to concave up at x equals negative 1. So that's an inflection point at x equals negative 1. And same thing, it was concave up on the left side of x equals 3, but then it's concave down on the right side of x equals 3. So you have another inflection point at x equals 3. So there are inflection points when x equals negative 1 and also at x equals 3. Now, of course, graphing calculators and computers are great at graphing functions. Calculus provides a way to eliminate what may be hidden or out of view on a graph using technology. More importantly, calculus gives you a way to look at the derivatives of functions when there are no equation given. We've already seen previously that if you're given the graph of the derivative, we can sketch a graph of the original function. Well, you can do the same thing with the second derivative. We can summarize all the information that the derivatives, the first derivative and the second derivative, tell us about the shape of the graph. The function f of x is increasing if f prime of x is positive, and it's decreasing if f prime of x is negative. The second derivative tells us nothing about whether the function is increasing or decreasing. The function f of x is concave up if the second derivative is positive, and the function f of x is concave down if the second derivative is negative. Or, in other words, if your second derivative is positive, that means the first derivative is increasing. That means your slopes of the tangent lines are increasing. And if the second derivative is negative, that means the slope of the tangent lines are decreasing. Or f prime of x is decreasing. So let's now talk about what's called the second derivative test. The concavity of a function can also help us determine whether there are a critical point, is a local maximum or a local minimum, without actually using the first derivative test at all. So remember, the first derivative test told us if the function was increasing on the left side of the critical number and then it changed to decreasing, you have a local maximum. Or if it changed from decreasing to increasing, you have a local minimum. Well, you can use the second derivative to find out if you have a local max or a local min at a critical point. And here's how you can do that. If a function has a critical number at x equals c, so you've already found out the critical numbers, that's where the first derivative is equal to zero or undefined, you find out if it's concave up or concave down using the second derivative. If the function is concave up, so you have this graph, and you know you have a critical number, then it must be a local minimum because the only way the graph is concave up and you have a critical number is if you have a local minimum at the critical number. Or, on the other hand, if the function is concave down, so if your second derivative is a negative number and you know you have a critical number, 
then the graph must be this shape, must be concave down, and the critical number gives you a local maximum. So the second derivative test for local extrema says, find all the critical points of f of x, so that's using the first derivative. For the critical points where f prime of c is equal to zero, find the second derivative at x equals c. In other words, plug in x equals c into your second derivative. If the second derivative at c is a negative number, that means you're treating x equals c like it's a test value. You plug the test value into your second derivative, and the second derivative is negative. That means the graph is concave down. So if f of x is concave down, and there's a critical number at x equals c, it must be a local maximum because the graph is concave down. If f double prime of c is a positive number, so you plug x equals c into your second derivative and it's a positive number, that means the original function is concave up at x equals c. And if x equals c is a critical point also, then you must have a local minimum at x equals c. And the last case, if the second derivative at c is zero, then f of x might have a local max, it might have a local minimum, or more importantly, it might be neither a local max nor a local min at x equals c. So this last case is telling you, you can't use the second derivative to tell you if you have a local max or a local min if f double prime of c is equal to zero. So why do we need to learn the second derivative test to find out if you have a local max or a local min if the first derivative tells you that already using a sign chart? The second derivative test is actually often easier to use than the first derivative test. You only have to find the sign of one number for each critical number rather than finding two. So what that means is using the first derivative test, you had to construct a sign chart. You had to pick test values on either side of your critical number to find out if the function is either increasing or decreasing. The second derivative test means you only plug in your critical number into the second derivative and you have to find out the sign of it. The second derivative test is actually also easier to use if you have a polynomial function. However, if you have to use the product rule, the quotient rule, or the chain rule to find the first derivative, finding the second derivative will be even more work. So even though the second derivative test might be easier to use, it doesn't always give you an answer. Keep in mind, you have this case where it's inconclusive, whether you have a local max or a local min. You might just want to use the first derivative test in that case. So example seven, second derivative test. Find the local maximum and local minimum values for the function f of x equals 2x cubed, subtract 15x squared, plus 24x, subtract 7, using the second derivative test for local extrema. So we're not going to make a sign chart for the first derivative. We're going to use the second derivative this time. So the first step is to find all the critical numbers of f of x. So to find the critical numbers, find the first derivative, f prime of x is equal to, the derivative of the first term is 6x squared, the derivative of the second term is negative 30x, Third term, derivative is 24, and derivative of negative 7 is 0. So you have 6x squared, subtract 30x plus 24, that's f prime of x. Now you want to find the critical numbers, so you need to simplify this. Factor out the 6 that's in common with all three terms. So 6 on the outside, you have an x squared from the first term, a negative 5x from the second term, and you have a positive 4 from the third term. Now you have a trinomial, x squared minus 5x plus 4 left over. Maybe it factors even further. What are two numbers that multiply to 4? And the same two numbers need to add to negative 5, negative 4 and negative 1. So 6 times x minus 4 times x minus 1 is how f prime of x factors. Since f prime of x is a polynomial function, f prime of x is undefined, never occurs, so you don't get any critical numbers from this part of the problem, but f prime of x could be 0. So that means you have 6 times x minus 4 times x minus 1 could be 0. So 6 can't be 0. But x minus 4 could be 0, that gives you x equals 4, and x minus 1 equals 0 gives you x equals 1. These are your two critical numbers for f of x, x equals 4 and x equals 1. However, we're not going to construct a sign chart. If you were using the first derivative test, you would construct a sign chart and you would put 1 and 4 on the sign chart and then choose test values on either side of the critical numbers. Let's use the second derivative test for local extrema. The second derivative test said, you plug your critical numbers into the second derivative to find out the sign. So we need a second derivative. f double prime of x would be derivative of 6x squared is 12x, derivative of negative 30x is negative 30, and derivative of 24 is 0. So f double prime of x is 12x subtract 30. Substitute in x equals 1 and substitute x equals 4 into the second derivative to find out is the function concave up or concave down at the critical number. So f double prime of 1 would give you 12 times 1 subtract 30, that's 12 subtract 30 or negative 18, so your second derivative is a negative number or a negative sign at x equals 1. That means the original function is concave down, and at your critical point, you have a local maximum. So you have a local maximum at x equals 1. 
Now let's try x equals 4. Plug 4 into the second derivative. So f double prime of 4 would be 12 times 4 subtract 30. 48 subtract 30 is positive 18. So at x equals 4, the second derivative is a positive number. That means the graph is concave up at x equals 4. Well, if it's concave up, that means you have a local minimum at the critical point. So local minimum at x equals 4. Now, in the problem, they're asking us to find what are the local maximum and local minimum values. Those are the y values. So you need to plug x equals 1 and x equals 4 back into the original function to find your y values. f of 1 will give you positive 4, and f of 4 will give you negative 23. So x equals 1 is where a local maximum occurred. The local maximum value is y equals 4. There was a local minimum at x equals positive 4. If you plug 4 into the function, the y value is negative 23. So the local minimum value is negative 23. Now one special case of the second derivative test is as follows. If the function has exactly one critical point and you know it's a local maximum or a local minimum, then it's the absolute maximum or absolute minimum for your function. And that means absolute max is the largest y value for the entire graph. Same thing for absolute minimum. If the function has a critical point and it's a local minimum at the critical point, it becomes an absolute minimum because the graph won't go down any further than that. To see this fact, look at the graph on the left. This is the entire graph. The function is concave down and you only have one critical number and it's at x equals c. If the first derivative at c is zero, that makes it a critical point. If you plug the critical number into the second derivative and it's negative, you have a concave down graph. And that's the entire graph, it's concave down. It doesn't change concavity. That means that x equals c, you have not just a local maximum, it's the absolute maximum for the graph. And now the same reasoning you can conclude on the graph on the right that it's an absolute minimum instead of a local minimum. Let's finish up with an application from business and economics. Point of diminishing returns. If a company decides to increase spending on advertising, it would expect sales to increase. At first, sales will increase at an increasing rate and then increase at a decreasing rate. The dollar amount x at which the rate of change of sales goes from increasing to decreasing is called the point of diminishing returns. So whenever you're talking about the rate of change goes from increasing to decreasing, you're already talking about a derivative and the derivative is increasing to decreasing, you're talking about the second derivative. So the second derivative is an application. This is also the amount at which the rate of change has a maximum value. Money spent beyond this amount may increase the sales, but at a much slower rate. So example eight, point of diminishing returns. Suppose that a convenience store is selling 200 ice cream cones. If the store invests X hundred dollars in an advertising campaign, the ad company estimates that monthly sales will be given by the function capital N of X is 4X cubed, subtract 0.25X to the fourth power plus 500, and X is between zero and 12. So in other words, the company is only going to invest between zero and $1,200 for this advertising campaign. When is the rate of sales increasing? And when is the rate of sales decreasing? What is the point of diminishing returns? And what's the maximum rate of change of sales? The rate of change of the sales is increasing means the second derivative is a positive number. And the rate of sales is decreasing tells you that the second derivative is negative. Since we're talking about the second derivative, we need to find two derivatives of this function n of x. So n prime of x, the first derivative would be derivative of 4x cubed is 12x squared. The derivative of the next term, negative 0.25x to the fourth. 4 times negative 0.25 is 1, so you have negative 1x to the third. The derivative of 500 is 0. So 12x squared minus x to the third power is n prime of x. So remember how this works with the second derivative test. You need to find all the critical numbers. So let's simplify this. You have an x squared in common that you can factor out from both terms. So you have x squared times 12 minus x left over. n prime of x is undefined, never occurs. So you don't get any critical numbers from this part, but n prime of x could be zero. That means x squared times 12 minus x could be zero. So if x squared is equal to zero, that means x must be zero. And 12 minus x equals zero gives you x equals 12 when you solve that equation. Now let's find out what the second derivative of n of x is. So we have the first derivative, it's 12x squared minus x cubed. Let's take another derivative. n double prime of x would be derivative of 12x squared is 24x. The derivative of negative x cubed is negative 3x squared. So now let's try to factor this. You have a 3x in common from both terms, factor it out. So 3x times, you have an eight from the first term, 
and a minus x from the second term. So the second derivative is 3x times 8 minus x. So again, the second derivative is a polynomial function, so n double prime of x is undefined. That never occurs. You'll never be dividing by x. However, n double prime of x could be 0, means 3 times x times 8 minus x in parentheses could be 0. 3x equals 0 gives you x equals 0 as a solution, and 8 minus x equals 0 gives you x equals 8 as a solution. So x equals 0 and x equals 8. x equals 0 doesn't make any sense because the company is spending money on advertising. You can't spend zero dollars on advertising. So the only value that goes on the sign chart for the second derivative will be x equals 8. So let's make a sign chart. Sign chart for the second derivative, so n double prime of x. So it divides up the number line into values that are less than 8 and greater than 8. So let's choose x equals 5 as a test value and x equals 10 as a test value. These go into the second derivative so we can find out the concavity, which will tell us whether the rate of change is increasing or decreasing. So at x equals 5, that goes into the second derivative. So n double prime of 5 would be 3 times 5 times 8 minus 5 in parentheses. That will give you positive 45. So a positive number means that the function n of x is concave up. So if the graph is concave up, we know that we won't have a local maximum. We'll have a local minimum. So let's check the other value. x equals 10. n double prime of 10 would be 3 times 10 times 8 minus 10. That will give you negative 60, a negative number. So when x equals 10, the graph is concave down. So that means the graph will have a local maximum. And since the graph has a local maximum, we know where the local maximum will occur. It will occur at the critical number x equals 12, because that's the only critical number that makes sense for the problem. x equals 0, we can't spend $0 on advertising again. So 12 is the only critical number, and so it must be the absolute maximum. So when is the rate of sales increasing? up until $1,200 were spent on advertising. And when is it decreasing? If you spend any more than $1,200 on advertising, the function will start to decrease after the local maximum at x equals 12. What is the point of diminishing returns? Well, the diminishing returns is when, when the concavity will change. The concavity changes when $800 are spent on advertising. So the point of diminishing returns occurs at x equals 8, 100 sales. So this finishes our video on points of inflection and also using the second derivative test. If you have any questions about any of the examples in this video, please let me know. Or if you have any questions while you work on the homework for this section, please let me know that as well. And I'll see you at the next video when we talk about Le Hopital's rule.